put our hands together for Jesus. Hey, you can be seated. So glad to be in the house of God with you. I want to also welcome those of you who are joining us online. Thank you for making time in your week. Regardless of what platform you're on, what day you're choosing to worship with us, thankful that you made time to worship Jesus and grow in our faith together today. Hey, if you have your Bible with you today, turn to Mark chapter 10. And be patient, we'll get there here in a moment. Today's an exciting day. Today's Serve Team Sunday. And what Serve Team Sunday represents is it's the opportunity. We just highlight some of the ways that every one of you can connect to make a difference in the house of God. And listen, servanthood is important to the heart of God. And we need to be servants in the house of God. We need to be servants in our community. But Serve Team Sunday is all about us highlighting opportunities and ways that we want to invite you to become a significant part, an important part of what God is doing in the house of God. So I, today's Serve Team Sunday, I'm going to preach to you about Serve to Succeed. I'm going to tie it into our existing sermon series, which is This Means War, because one of the key ways that you can win spiritual battles in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, is by adopting the posture of servanthood. That there are so many times and so many ways that when we stump our toe, when we lose a battle, it's because we've lost sight of the call and the command to serve. And we've, we've bought into the lie that, that our life is about ourself. We've, got, we've become consumed with our own ideas or our own preferences or, our, or the way that others maybe around us can serve us. And I'm telling you, when we do that, when we are, when we are, are selfish, we are most like the enemy when we are serving sacrificially in the house of God, in the community, in your marriage, in your family, in your home, you are most like Christ. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this today. We're gonna unpack it. And I hope and I pray and I believe that if you'll grab a hold of this in a new way, in a fresh way, it'll change every area of your life. Every area of your life. We are not just trying to get people into positions of servanthood in the church. If you will adopt the attitude and the posture of of a servant, watch how it'll change your friendships. Watch how it'll change your workplace. Watch how it'll change your marriage. Watch how it'll change the atmosphere of your home and your family. Because when we serve, it invites the spirit and the presence of God. So this means war. Matthew chapter 16 has been a key uh, verse for this, uh, this whole series a key passage for us, and it's the passage where Jesus is coming to his disciples, and he's saying, who do men say that I am? And it's the most important question that you and I will ever answer. The the answer that we give to this question resonates for all of eternity. It determines your eternity. And so he said, who do do people say that I am? And, And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and he said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And he says, I tell you, you are Peter. He renames him. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. The rock was not Peter because Peter was up one day and down the next. The rock was the revelation of who Jesus was. And he said, on this rock, the revelation of who I really am, that I'm not just some religious figure, that I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one that's come to save the world and, and rescue the world from their sins and deliver them back into a place of relationship that transcends religion. That's who I am. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And he goes on and he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What? The church. And so here's, here's what we've been drawing out of this is that The church was intended, it was right from the start. This is the first time that Jesus uses this word church and he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. You and I, those called together in the name of Jesus to represent the gospel, to to, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, he says the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And here's what we understand is that gates, I've never seen gates chasing anyone down. Gates are static, gates are positional. Gates are established to keep people behind or to keep people out. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Here's the point. The church was always intended to be an active force of good in our community. We were never intended. And here's here's what I've been uh, drawing out for us is that the church has lost its way in a sense. 
We've lost our sense that we are, are, are called to be an active force, preaching the gospel, destroying the works of the enemy, representing the abundant life of Jesus Christ to people. And we've gathered in our buildings and we've lost sight of our mission. The church was not built for bake sales and bingo nights. The church was built to win spiritual battle. And if you call a bingo night or a bake sale, invite me, I will show up. But we are intended to be equipped to win a spiritual battle. And one reason that so many people, even believers, are getting beat up in life is because the church has focused more on bake bake sales and bingo nights instead of equipping the people of God to live in the victory of Jesus. And we've got to return to our original mission. Right from the start, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm telling you, everything that plagues our community Every, every scheme, every, every, every trap of division, every place where there's poverty, every place where there's darkness, the people of God who are called by the name of Jesus Christ were intended to be deputized to go into those places and bring about the light of Jesus in a way that causes a shift, that causes a change, that causes the victory of Christ to begin to be seen, to begin to be felt, that brings hope, that brings healing, that brings a comfort to hurting people. That's who we're called to be. So today I want to talk to you about the power, the power of servanthood over the spiritual battles in your life. Did I ask you to turn to Mark chapter 10? If, you, if I didn't, turn to Mark chapter 10, and this is an encouraging message. I love that the Bible doesn't shy away from the, the weak moments that people had, and this is one of the weakest moments that anyone ever had, I believe, and you'll see here in a moment what I mean And it's encouraging to me because how many of you know every now and then I still blow it, you know, and so I could be encouraged by reading and understanding that even people that walked with Jesus in the flesh had some bad moments, had some unfortunate things that they thought or said, even as they walked with Jesus. And Mark chapter 10, we see what's titled in my Bible, it says, the request of James and John. And in verse 35, let's read it together. It says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and they said, teacher, We want you to do whatever for us, whatever we ask. (laughs) In verse 36, it says, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And Jesus responded, verse 38, he said, you do not know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? And they said, we can. And Jesus said to them, well, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And reading on, it says, when the 10 heard about this, the other disciples, it said they became indignant with James and John. It was like, did you hear what James and John did? Did you hear what they had the nerve to go to the Lord and ask him about? And reading on, it says, Jesus called them together. Jesus knew what was going on, that they were kind of like upset with James and John, that they would have the nerve to come to Jesus and say, would you give us to the most prominent places of position in the heavenly places when you set up your kingdom? And, and it said, Jesus called them over and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles Lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. So he's, he's making a contrasting statement. He's saying, in the world, people that have leadership use it for their own advantage, and they take advantage of other people because of their positions of leadership. That's what he's saying. But watch what he says, verse 43. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great, somebody say, become great, among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he says, if you want to be great, you serve. And here's what I want to encourage you with today. We, we We need great Christian leaders. We need, we need great Christian individuals. We need, God does not despise greatness. He despises pride and he resists selfishness. 
but he's making a statement here that actually is creating the opportunity. He's, he's giving us the recipe for how to be great and how to be great in a way that God can endorse and bless. And he says, the greatest among you must be a servant. And I'm just telling you, we need great Christians. We need Christians. We need politicians who are Christians who will rise up and stand up and protect liberties and protect freedoms. We need a young, young people, a young generation of, of great young Christian leaders who will be influencers and culture shapers and won't just go with the flow, but will begin to stand up for Jesus and will begin to speak up and begin to go to the places that God's called you to go. We need great Christians in our society, in our culture. And he's given you the recipe for how to be great. He said, if you want to be great, adopt the attitude of a servant. In any area of your life, in your workplace, you want to be great, go and serve. In, in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in your community, if you want to be great, serve. God does not despise greatness. He resists pride and selfishness. The pathway to greatness that God can endorse is paved with servanthood. And so today's Serve Team Sunday, we're encouraging you to serve. And I'm preaching a message that transcends the opportunities to serve on Wednesdays or Sundays or during the week here at the church because this is something, this is not just something that we do, this is who we're called to be. And listen, the church has not done anyone any favors by muting the call to serve from the call to discipleship. Amen. Churches that fail to emphasize servanthood will fail to make disciples. Because you cannot Follow Jesus if you're not going to serve. And we've been worried about seeker friendliness, and we've been worried about not challenging people, and I'm telling you, we need to challenge people to discipleship. And we have not done marriages any favors by not challenging men to be servants. We have not done families any favors by not challenging people to serve. We haven't done our nation and our culture any favors by not challenging our young people to not just come and be consumers of Christianity, but to find a way to give their life away. We have got to restore and revitalize the message and the power and the importance and the priority of servanthood. Churches that fail to emphasize servanthood will fail to make disciples. Because it said right here, I did not, Jesus said, I, even I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life away as a ransom for many. Philippians 2 verse 5 says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He's, the Bible's setting the standard right here. Have the mindset of Christ Jesus, reading on verse 6, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Someone ought to say amen. amen. Jesus was exalted by God because he lowered himself as a servant. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What would happen in your marriage if today you take this, this revelation, you take this reminder, you take this message, and I mean you grabbed a hold of it with all of your heart. And you begin to go and you begin to say, how do I not just hear this, but how do I begin to live this out? How do I begin to, to actively, proactively, selflessly serve? And I'm just telling you, the best marriages are two selfless servants in love with one another. The worst marriages are people who are in marriage just for whatever they can get from another person. Our culture has adopted that philosophy and we use people and we abuse people and once we get and extract everything that we can out of people, we kick them to the curb. And the spirit of Jesus says, I serve and I serve and I serve and I serve and I give and I lay down my life. And I'm just telling you, what if in your relationships, what if in your home, what if in your workplace, you adopted the same attitude that Christ Jesus had? He said, I might have some privileges, I might have some rights, but I'm laying them down to the end result of serving others. And I'm just telling you, there would be a, it would be like spiritual Febreze was sprayed in your home, in your marriage, in your relationship, everywhere that you go, because the spirit of God is attracted to servanthood. In a world that's pursuing power, 
possessions, prestige, promotion, and position. Power, possessions, prestige, promotion, and position. The blessing of God is found in pursuing purpose. Pursuing purpose. And here's the thing is your purpose will always, your purpose will always, your purpose will always be connected to serving people. Whatever God's called you to do, if you're preaching the word, if you're selling insurance, if you're teaching children, if you're raising children, whatever God has called you to do, your purpose is always connected to serving people if your purpose is found in God. We gotta be about making disciples who serve. I'm just telling you, I mean, our culture is, is not gonna change unless we begin to serve our culture. Our culture, our homes, our marriages, all those places that are important to God and thus should matter to us, they will not shift or change unless we begin to once again challenge and call and convict and emphasize you are called to servanthood. The church would do better to stop recruiting volunteers and begin to develop servants. And maybe the reason we don't have enough people to help the kids and to do the media things and to serve the coffee and the adult, we're always looking, we're always looking, we're always needing is because we've settled for recruiting volunteers instead of imparting the spirit of servanthood and the call to discipleship. We would do better to begin to emphasize the call to give your life away to realize that you didn't get saved just for your own self. You got saved to serve others and you got saved to now stand in the place and you got saved to lay your own life down so that now someone can, on, your, on the back of your servanthood and on the back of your testimony, could, someone else can find Christ and find God and find forgiveness and find hope and find healing and find restoration. We didn't just get saved for ourselves. We gotta break our holy huddle and we gotta begin to serve others in the name of Jesus. It's the only thing that's going to lead to revival in Lawrence, Kansas and revival in the United States of America if the people of God begin to once again embrace the call to discipleship that calls and compels us to serve. I said it again, I said it before, but it bears repeating the church would do better to stop recruiting volunteers and begin to develop servants. There's something that shifts, there's something that happens when we begin to shift from volunteer to servant. From volunteer to servant. I wanna contrast some of these things. Number one is it takes you from task to team. It takes you from task to team. You no longer just see, oh, I gotta go and do that thing. You understand, I'm a part of a team that's serving the purposes of God, and I'm a part of a team that's gathering to, to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach and deliver the good news, and give people a refuge of hope and healing, a place where they can find freedom, and a place where they can be ministered to, and they can be prayed with, and a place where we can begin to speak a better word over their life. When we shift from volunteer to servant, it takes us from task to a team. First Corinthians 12 is such a powerful chapter, and it so clearly establishes how important it is that we all put our hands on the plow of this thing called the gospel. We all step up and stand into the place of the grace that God has called or put upon your life, that when we do it together, there's exponential impact and increase in the body of Christ, and most of the church though relegates and delegates most of the responsibilities to just a few people. But watch what it says, verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For we in one spirit were all baptized into one body. Somebody say one body. <laughs> Jews, Greeks, slaves, free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. Say one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And if the foot should say, because maybe some of you are hearing this or say, well, this is good for that person or that person, I'm telling you, this message is for you. We need you to step in. We need you to begin to do your part and to, and to say, what can I do to be a part of furthering the gospel in our, in our community and in our city? It says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. Would, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. And if all were a single member, where would the body be? 
as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Say one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there would be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen, I'm just telling you, the people that are behind the scenes today matter more than what I'm doing. I couldn't preach the word of God to people. We couldn't lead people to Jesus at the end of this service today if there weren't people who were willing to show up early and unlock the doors and prepare the atmosphere. And I'm just telling you what this is saying right here is the, the opportunities to serve that seem less significant are actually more important and more significant in the eyes of God. Don't diminish the significance or importance of what you could put your hands to starting right now. Maybe you would say, I, but I'm a, I'm a new believer, I'm a new Christian, or I've never done anything in the church, I'm telling you, there's a place for you to serve that's significant to the purposes of God. There's a place for you to begin to serve, even if it's just opening the door and welcoming people with a smile and beginning to establish the atmosphere over their heart that prepares the way for the word of God to penetrate their life and bring hope or healing or freedom in their life. I'm telling you, there's something that's important for you to do when we shift from Volunteerism to servanthood, it shifts us from task to team. Number two, it shifts us from hands to heart. And the statement I'll make here is that there's something that's powerful in our life when servanthood becomes something that we not just do, but it becomes who we are. When we begin to have the heart of a servant, when we begin to say, listen, I, I don't go and I don't do what they ask me to do just because it's a task. I go and I do it because my heart is compelled I, I, I've shifted from just seeing that it's something that I, I do with my hands. It's something that I pour my heart into. It attracts the Spirit of God. Number three, it takes you from position to disposition. And one of the big fallacies about servanthood is that it has to do with menial tasks. And the world is, is all about position. They're looking for promotion and prestige and possessions and, and all those things. And, and when you really get, grasp the heart of Christ, which is the heart of servanthood, it, it doesn't just become a title or a position, it becomes a disposition, in other words, an attitude. It's not tied to position or title. Listen, you can be a janitor with a terrible attitude. You could be the president and CEO of the entire outfit and you can have a servant's heart. Servanthood, God isn't fooled by by menial tasks, and God isn't dissuaded by people who succeed and are elevated and promoted. What God's looking for is whatever it is that God gives you, the assignment, the position, the promotion, will you do it with the attitude and the posture of servanthood? Will you say, Lord, I recognize you blessed me with this company, and now everything that I do, the insurance I sell, the, 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 the patients I treat, whatever it is that I do, the kids that I teach, I do it from a posture of servanthood. I do whatever I do in the name of Jesus in a way that somehow, some way will point people to him and help them to know that there's a God who loves and a God who cares. I do what I do because you have saved me and now I am blessed and privileged to serve others in your name. It shifts us from task to team, from hands to heart, from position to disposition. Three C's of servanthood, and then we'll wrap up and we'll worship and we'll ask the Lord to do something in our hearts and then we'll give you some time today to maybe go and connect with some people that can help you discover how to serve in the house of God on Serve Team Sunday. Three C's that will encourage you that you are called and created to serve, and that's the first C is that you're created for this. You were created, watch what Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10 says. Just throw some word of God at you here. Verse 8 says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. When you got saved, you, God didn't just have his idea on getting you to heaven, and let, let me tell you, heaven's a good place to be for all of eternity. But it says right here, you were created new in Christ Jesus for good works. There's some things that God has saved you out of to deliver you to, and now he's got an assignment for you. He's got some things. He's got some people. He's got some places that he's calling you to go. He's got some testimonies that he's calling you to tell. There are some people in your sphere of influence who need to hear and see Jesus shining through you, and they won't hear or won't see if you don't say yes. You were created to do good works. God prepared them in advance for you to do. You were created for this. Number two, you were called for this. 2 Timothy 1.9 says he has saved us and he has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his purpose and his grace. The grace that was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. You might say, well, I, I, but I just feel so inadequate, Pastor T. If you knew some of the things I was still struggling with, I'm just telling you, if you would commit in the midst of your own inadequacies and struggles to begin to just serve the purposes of God that you were created for and called to, just watch when you look up six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months from now after consistently saying yes to serve the purposes of God, just watch how serving others positions and postures you to begin to grow in spiritual maturity, to begin to win some of the battles that maybe you've been losing previously, to begin to begin to gather, when you begin to serve in the house of God, you begin to connect with the people of God, and you begin to become a part of something that's more significant and greater than your own self, and it begins to connect you to new places that God wants to deliver you to. Listen, take, take a look at this video. I want you to hear from, from some folks besides me who have discovered the power and the importance and the significance of serving in the house of God. Take a look at this, and I'll be back here in a moment. When I came to Rev City, I was just had a longing to be a part of a church family and to just be around a lot of other believers and to just um, get to know the people that I was worshiping with every Sunday. Like it just helps me feel more at home when I'm invested and a part of it and, and helping to make it happen, I guess, and, and having a part in that. Getting to serve, being allowed to serve is, is just, it's fun. Um, you get to serve around great people that are fun to be around, you know, while while serving our God. Before, you know, you get into a church and it's just so easy to feel like you are alone. Nobody knows you, like nobody sees you. But serving puts you into a smaller community where you can connect with other people. I just feel like God has gifted us all with different talents and different skills and it's very important to share that with other people. I started doing the seat backs and making sure all the papers were available and in order and kind of all uniform and then but there's always opportunities to just grow, um, grow in faith and grow in relationship and that's been one of the best blessings of it I think. I just have understood the importance of community by just being involved here and so I just want other people to be able to experience that too because it really is life changing to have other believers that have your back and that um, support you and I want other people to be able to know that that is something that they can experience too. If you don't know what you're good at, they will find a spot for you. Come as you are and Jesus is willing to meet you at whatever point that you're in. God doesn't uh, call the equipped, he equips the called. And so when you just take that step of obedience, if you feel like God's calling you to serve in some capacity, or you just want to get involved, God's gonna, God's gonna grow you and equip you. Like, okay, God, like, thank you for letting me serve in your house. This is where I can serve now. And if you have something for me in the future, I'll take that step and follow up with wherever you want me to go. And so he'll lead and <laughs> just be faithful to follow. I think one way to have a better relationship with Jesus is just to serve other people. Because there's a scripture that says, He who waters will himself be watered. Rev City is just a huge family, and like everyone really does support each other. And I just have gotten to know so many people through just being involved with different things. It's been amazing to be a part of, just to be able to pray over them, um, and just see them then step into those roles and pray for other people. It's like we're around each other a lot, but 
get together and serve, and it's we have a lot of fun doing it. A lot of fun doing it. So. Everybody's in <laughs>
And I pray, God, that you would just, you would burn this on the hearts of every person today in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. We're going to worship, but before we do, I want to give you the opportunity to come home to Jesus. If you're here and you're far from him, and maybe you once knew him, you loved him, you were raised in the Christian church, but you've drifted from God, or you made some bad choices or some poor decisions, and you're far from God today, you're what the Bible would describe as a prodigal son or daughter. Or maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never confessed your need for a savior. You've never received what it feels like to have all the weight of guilt and sin and shame that the enemy tries to saddle us with because all of us, each of us, the Bible says, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if that's you, you're a prodigal son or daughter or you've never put your faith in Jesus and never received his forgiveness, which is a free gift that you can't earn, you receive it by faith. If that's you, you're in either one of those camps or anywhere in between, come on, right now, don't wait. Lift your hand high towards heaven and say, that's me, I need forgiveness. That's me, I need a fresh start. That's me, I need a savior. That's me, I need to be restored to my heavenly father. I'm far from him today. And I'm telling you today as you're raising your hand and those of you who are online, I wanna encourage you. It's powerfully important that you would pull over to the side of the road or or stand up from your couch and lift your hand high towards heaven. You're not responding to a preacher, you're responding to a father. And you can lower your hand if you lifted it today. Here's what we do, every week we do it this way. For two reasons, we pray this prayer together as a family. One body, one spirit, one family. And we do it to quickly affirm to those who are responding in the room and online that there's a church family that wants to come alongside you. And the second reason we all pray it every week is we realize we're growing in our faith, we're maturing in our faith, but we never graduate from grace. Everything that God could ever build in your life is all built on the foundation of unmerited grace through Jesus Christ. So come on church, let's pray this. Say, Father in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a savior. I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price that I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life, I give you my trust, and because of Jesus, come on, say with all your heart, I will never be the same, and then rejoice with all of heaven for the precious people who came home.